Good morning, we're going to get started. All right, so hopefully everybody got their grades. Yes? So usually the first midterm that I give is about that mean. It's almost a straight scale, right? When it's 75%, it's a straight scale, essentially. So um, that the, the first midterm, I usually get a really high mean. It probably won't be as high the next midterm, OK? Because we, we're doing a lot of more complicated things. Stereochemistry is a little uh, difficult for a lot of students. So we also had a lot of people leaving early, um, so that means it was a good test length. The next test, I doubt it anybody will leave early because the stereochemistry takes some time. And so you're going to be able to bring your models next time and building models and all that ends up taking time. Um, so the exams go to the scanners today. They, I usually get the file about 5 or 6 o'clock on Thursday. As soon as I get the file, I will upload it to the, grade, to the drop box so you can look at your midterm. Are there any questions before we get started? Anybody? All right. Yes? So is this class based on the straight scale or are you? No, it's a curve. Oh, it's definitely a curve. Yeah. But you know, you looked at, if you if you looked at your grade online and you saw the curve, it's not a very good Gaussian distribution. You know, and that's what happens when you have a high mean. It doesn't look as good. I like to have it, you know, just like that. I'd, I'd love to have it centered at 50. I probably can't, but that gives you the best curve. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? All right. So we're going to finish talking about nomenclature today, and then we're going to talk about nomenclature, a little briefly about nomenclature of cycloalkanes, and then something brand new, which is conformations. So we're going to talk about that. All right, so we were running through an example for systematic IUPAC nomenclature. I will have a nomenclature um, problem on, the, on midterm, too. All right, so we were kind of going through the pro process. We, were, um, we circled the longest continuous chain that, um, that, that uh, contains the most branches. That was our parent. Our parent was hexane. Then we looked at the... Um, branches here and we number in the direction to give the first branch the lowest number. So if we number from this direction, one, two, three, our first branch is at carbon three. If we number um, in this direction, one, two, our first branch is at carbon two. So we want to number from this direction. Then you're going to name each branch and give a number for the, for the Number of the carbon of the parent that's, in, that's on, that's ethyl is on carbon 3. This to, the, we have two methyls. One is at, a, did I number that right? We're going 1, 2, methyl, methyl, I, yeah, 2, 4. So I numbered, I wouldn't recommend numbering in both directions like I did. I would remember, I recommend writing it out because now I'm getting confused when I'm naming it. So we have 2, 4 dimethyl. 3 ethyl, and now we have to construct the name, the total name together. So we're going to write the substituents first, so these guys first in alphabetical order. So um, E comes before um, D, so, no, D comes before E. Well, let's just, let, let me just go, let's go through this. Um, substituent groups are listed in alphabetical order. The numerical prefixes di, tri, etc., as well as the prefix tert and sec are ignored in alphabetizing. So I was getting, I was jumping one step ahead of myself. So the dye doesn't count in alphabetizing. Ethyl comes before methyl. The prefixes iso, neo, and cyclo are considered. We're really not going to have to worry about those too much. So we do count the iso, the neo, and the cyclo, but not the dye, tri, tert, and sec. It's a little bit crazy to remember that. I wouldn't, don't worry too much about that. I, I kind of avoid examples like that. All right. So we would call this 3-ethyl, <laughs> what? Did I do something wrong? OK, I missed that. All right, well. OK, 2,4, dimethyl, hexane. So now. Um, I am not super hardcore on my test, so there's no space between the dimethyl and the hexane. 
If you put a space between the dimethyl and the hexane, on my test I would not mark it wrong. Sapling will mark it wrong. Okay? If you have more than one substituent, we have a two comma and then a four dash. This is a dash, all of that. It has to be exact for the, remember sapling's a computer and it's going to mark it wrong if you don't have that just right. Okay? Questions on how I named that? Anybody? All right. Let's talk about nomenclature of cycloalkanes. General formula CNH2N, add the prefix cyclo to the alkane name. So if we have a three-membered ring, that would be propane, and we're just going to put cyclo right in front of it. Not too difficult. Cyclopropane, cyclobutane, cyclopentane, cyclohexane, cycloheptane. Substituents are named in a similar way they, as they are in straight chain. If the ring has two different substituents, they are cited in alphabetical order, and the number one position is given to the substituent cited first. So this one right here would be methylcyclohexane. We didn't write one dash methylcyclohexane because if there's only one substituent on the ring, you don't have to put a number. So no uh, one is necessary. if there's only one substituent on the ring. Now, that being said, if you write one methylcyclohexane on one of my tests, I wouldn't care and I would get mark it completely right. If you write that on sapling, it will mark it wrong. Yes? Why is it MC alphabetically? Is that alphabetical as well? Or is this one's not. This is just a substituent on the ring. This is where you have more than one. Then you have to pick alphabetical. So as you see, we have an ethyl. We have an ethyl and we have a methyl. Ethyl comes before methyl in the alphabet, so we're going to start numbering this direction. We're not going to go clockwise. We're going to go counterclockwise because we want the next substituent to have the lower number. And if we don't do that, if we number this direction, one, two, three, four, then methyl would have Number four, we want it to have the lower number. So this would be one, eth one dash ethyl, three methyl, cyclopentane. There is no dash before the pentane. I just ran out of space here. Okay, so if you could fit it all in without putting a dash there, do it that way. And again, um, we don't put a space between the methyl and the cyclo cyclopentane. There's no space there. If you write a space on the test, I don't care. But sapling will care. So really simple nomenclature for um, cycloalkanes. This is about the complicate. This is about the level that I would ask on the test. So so same thing here. Something about this complicated. Nothing more complicated than that. It gets very complicated. We're not going to be doing that. There's also common names. Um, some organic compounds are identified using common names that don't follow IUPAC. There's just a few that we're going to sprinkle around in each chapter that you need to know. Um, so I have some examples here. You do not need to have these names memorized, but we sometimes do use common names. So these are just some fun structures. There are some chemists who just like to make fun structures just because they're cool to make, and I can make it. There's um, somebody out there that's made little molecules that look like people, nanoputians, nan nanokids, nanoputians, and they make all different kind of hats for the, you know, the nanoputians. So just, just to make these fun. So these are some fun common names. Again, you don't need to memorize these, but we have cubane, houseane, churchane, because it's got a little steeple there, basketane, because it's got a little handle, uh, window pane. <laughs> <laughs> I would have called it window pane ain, but you know, window pane, prismane, tetrane, and twistane. So there's a bunch. This is just um, a few of them. Again, please do not, I'm not going to ask you to name those. Although you probably could pretty easily, right? Some of them, housing and churching. All right, a little bit of physical properties. Um, alkanes contain only nonpolar carbon hydrogen carbon carbon bonds. And so they only get weak van der Waals forces. If they get really large, then they'll have large van der Waals forces. And 
and some pretty significant um, boiling points and melting points and, and the like. But if we're just talking about small molecules, this, these are very weak forces. So for example, this is propane. So this is the gas that you use um, for the barbecue grills. Minus 40 degree, 42 degrees. Minus 30, uh, this is 36 degrees when we add two more carbons. When we do branching, so this is five all together. When we branch the five, the boiling point goes up. This is an ether just in comparison. We have 34.6 degrees and 117 for the alcohol. So again, we're not, mem we're not memorizing we're not memorizing boiling points or melting points here. Melting point minus 188, minus 130 for the five carbon chain, minus 17 for branching. Higher melting point because you can pack it better in a crystal lettuce. And then we have the ether minus 116. Minus 90 for the alcohol. So um, for this first one, van der Waals. Van der Waals. Van der Waals only. The ether has van der Waals plus dipole dipole. And the last one, the alcohol. Van der Waals plus dipole dipole plus hydrogen bonding. Question? Yeah. Uh, how does the dipole dipole and the H bonding affect the melting point? You know, it gets really tricky. And I usually steer clear of melting point questions. You notice I didn't ask you any melting point questions because melting point is all about how well it packs. And that's sometimes hard for you to picture. So we have a higher, we have a higher, uh, melting point for this because it's like a it's it's like a sphere, and so even though we have dipole dipole here, we have a higher melting point for this one and that one. So I steer clear of melting point questions. I'm just including them here for completeness' sake, but I don't usually ask melting point questions. All right. The only there's only one time when I do that, and that is in 51B, and it's for obvious reasons when we're talking about saturated fats and fatty acids and all that kind of stuff. So, all right. Alkanes have low boiling points and melting points compared to more polar compounds. Boiling point and melting point increases as the number of carbons increases. That's certainly a trend that you need to know, because of increased surface area, boiling point decreases with increased branching because of decreased surface area, and melting point increases with increased symmetry. And again, we stay away from melting point pretty much. And that leads us on to our, our, our uh, next topic, which is brand new, and that's co something called conformations. So conformations of ethane we'll start with. So we know a little bit about the bonding in ethane. We know that each carbon is sp3 hybridized. And we know that this central bond here between the two carbons, it's a sigma bond. And we have an sp3 and an sp3 on carbon overlapping to make that sigma bond. We also know that a sigma bond has circular symmetry. So um, if, we, if we shaded that whole region in, it's kind of like a sausage. And it's circular symmetry because we could slice it crosswise and we would get a, circular, a circle every time. So um, it turns out that sigma bonds can rotate very easily. And so that central bond is actually going to rotate. And when it rotates, because of that circular symmetry, nothing changes in that concentration of electron density between the two carbons because it's right there in the center. So when it rotates, it's still maintaining that same symmetry. And we're not changing the amount of electron density. So um, barrier to rotation. So it takes, does take a little energy to rotate here, the barrier to rotation. for a carbon-carbon single bond. Is about three to six kcals per mole. Molecules just by virtue of temperature at room temperature have 20 kcals per mole of kinetic energy. 
So um, available energy for molecules, just, and this is just a virtue of temperature. The number would be higher at higher temperature, but available energy at room temperature is 20 K cows per mole. So more than enough for this energy barrier. And it turns out that these things are spinning very, very rapidly at room temperature because three, three to six kcals per mole, we've got 20 to spare. It's very easy for that rotation to take place. So the two methyl groups that we have here, methyl on each side, are not fixed in a single position but are free to rotate about the sigma bond. The different spatial arrangements that result from rotation are called conformations. And this will give you a little bit of an idea of where this barrier to rotation comes from in the first place. All right, so here is this. And I, I basically drew these in Spartan. And you can actually draw these very quickly. It takes you less than a minute to draw these. And you can do the rotation so you can get a little picture of what this looks like. So there's a couple ways to do this. You can do it in Spartan. And, um, or you can open up your models. Hopefully you all have your models. This would be a good time to take that plastic wrap off the models and take them out and start making models and see, actually seeing what this looks like. So we've got two ways to do that. Again, very easy to do in um, Spartan. All right, so here this little arrow you'll recognize probably from this, the work that you've done in Spartan. That's the rotation. So rotation occurs here. Of course, all of the carbon-hydrogen bonds are also spinning, but we're focusing on the carbon-carbon bond right now. But all of them are spinning very, very rapidly. All right, so, um, and so we, when we do these rotations, we usually um, fix one carbon and rotate the other and see what the rotation looks like relative. There's no rule that you have to fix one. It just makes it easier to, to figure out what's going on. So um, for example, if we, if we keep our eye on this one, and we rotate this car methyl on the, on the right and not the one on the left. So I'm keeping the left-hand side the same. And I'm just going to rotate this down. Um, now it's right here. So we can, you can track that. So uh, location changes with rotation. All right, so um, there's some names for the different conformations. In the staggered conformation, the carbon-hydrogen bonds on one carbon are bisect the HCH bond angle on the adjacent carbon. What do we mean by that? So um, if you look at, if you focus right here on this, these two hydrogens here, it's kind of making a V here. And this one is right smack in the middle. It cuts that V right in half. So it's bisecting this uh, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen angle on the, on the um, opposite carbon. So that's uh, the staggered conformation. And then um, eclipsed conformation, the carbon-hydrogen bonds on one carbon are directly aligned with the carbon-hydrogen bonds on the adjacent carbon. So this, uh, of course, is kind of like a, when you have a solar eclipse, they're right lined up with each other. So we're using the same terminology. So if you look here, this hydrogen right here, is exactly lined up and these guys also are lined up. So there's a V here, there's a V here on this carbon. This hydrogen, when we rotate that down, now it's in the, here it's in the staggered, here it's in the eclipsed conformation. So this is staggered and this is eclipsed. Now, of course, we can't be expected to draw these things. I mean, we need a program to draw that, or you have to be very, very good at, um, at drawing to be able to draw these models like that. So we have a way to draw these so you don't have to draw these mo um, models like this so you can actually see what's going on. And so um, I have a model right here that shows what this looks like. Um, let's take this off for a second here. All right, so here's what it, here's here's some, and I have different colors for the different bonds, but you know, so we're rotating one like this, and so what basically what we do is you grab the center bond here. I'll grab it like this, and then you go like this and rotate it like that. 
So you just, you're, you're basically, um, you're, you're, you're basically, it's like you're walking over to the side and looking at it from this angle. And that's the way we're going to draw it. Mercedes. Hmm? Mercedes. Excuse me? Mercedes. Mercedes, yeah, Mercedes, there you go. So you can look at the Mercedes symbol, all right? So we're going to draw it that way. So um, it's, it's, the, the way we draw this is called a Newman projection. So the, the front carbon right here is a dot. The back carbon is a big circle. And then these are the bonds that are coming off that circle. So the front carbon is a dot. The reason we make a front carbon a dot is because if we, if we make this a big circle and this a big circle, we won't know which is which because they're, they're basically right in front of each other, right? So we have to basically, so what we're doing is we're turning around this way and we're, we're, we're um, you can see it a little bit when we tilt it, but we're just going flat. So, so this bond is going back in the page and you can't see it. Okay, so that's the one that you're grabbing. So that's what I'm tr attempting to show here. Um, viewing from the left, Now, you don't have to view from the left. Um, I just have a habit of viewing from the left. So if you're looking at here, then I, I, what I do is I take it and I rotate the left carbon um, this way. You don't have to do that. You can rotate the other carbon. There's no rule about left or right. But I will consistently go from the left just so you can follow what I'm doing. But there's no rule. You may choose to go from the right. Whatever way you choose to do it, you have to be consistent. Okay, you have to be consistent, so choose your way. If you want your answers to match mine exactly, then you will go from the left. So that just means that you're going to rotate it that way. Um, if you go from the right, you rotate it that way, and it's not wrong. Now, some of the problems in sapling, they come from the right-hand side. Um, I hope that's not going to throw you off too much. You, you know, whatever way you pick, just be consistent so that you get, always get the right answers. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, so I've just kind of r rotated this. So this carbon that was on the left is now in the front. And then I'm, I, you tilt it up a little bit. So that the back carbon, you can't see the back carbon. It looks, if you look at that, it looks like, almost like that carbon has one, two, three, four, five, six bonds. But it doesn't. Um, because there's three of those come from the carbon in the back and three come from the carbon in the front. So the, um, the back carbon is hidden, from, is, is hidden behind the front carbon. So um, easier way to draw this. And this is our Newman projection. We have a circle, and that is the back carbon. Big circle. Front carbon is a dot. And now if you look at the front carbon here, and, and this is the way that I view it. Um, you're either going to get an upside down Y or a right side up Y. So in the front carbon here, can you see how this is, this, is the, this is a right side up Y? So this V part is the V part of the Y, and this is the, 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 where it, what it's, how it stands. And then the back, it's an upside down Y. Okay, so um, in the front, here's my Y in the front, just like that. So in the front, we have the lines extend past the circle. So that's my right side up Y. In the back, the bonds extend from, that, from the circle. They don't go all the way into the center. If you go all the way into the center, um, that's wrong. You can't draw it that way. So in the back, I have, a, I have an upside down Y. In the front, I have a right side up Y. Now, all of these here have hydrogens. That's a Newman projection. Okay. 
So uh, Newman projection, front carbon is a dot. Back carbon is a circle. There is something called a dihedral angle, which is the angle that we get between these two hydrogens here. If they were in the same plane, what is that angle there? What would that be? 60, I heard 60 here. Theta equals 60 degrees. So um, dihedral angle. Theta equals 60 degrees. This is the staggered conformation. So in the staggered conformation, the dihedral angles are 60 degrees for, every, all, for all the groups. Let's show the eclipse. So we have the eclipsed over here. So let's take a look at this here. We're going to draw this in a Newman projection. And again, I, I just rotated. So um, this carpet here it was on the left. And can you see how that's an uh, upside down Y? And in the back, it's also an upside down Y. And these are them right on top of each other. That's a little tricky to draw because the groups that we want to draw are right on top of each other. So we just tilt it a little and we're going to draw it like this. So we're going to tilt this up. And if we draw it completely exactly, we're not going to be able to see what's on the front and what's on the back. So we'll just do our best here. We've got our circle. We've got our dot. We've got our upside down Y. So again, the carbon that's the dot in the front, the bonds extend past the circle. And we are attempting to show, um, attempting to draw, split this circle into three, okay, nicely. Uh, so we're going to put our hydrogens there. How do we draw the other ones? Uh, I'm going to just kind of go, uh, I, I tend to make it a little shorter here. We we'll just kind of go here. We want to stay close to what we have here, but make it readable, okay? We can't, if we really showed it exactly, this would be tilted, they would be right on top of each other, but we can't do that. So that's the way we would show that. So make these very, very small. This, this distance between those two lines very small. So in this case, um, dihedral angle is zero. So this is the eclipsed conformation. And it's the highest energy conformation. So even though, it's in the, even though it's the highest energy conformation, for that molecule to rotate, it has to rotate through the eclipsed conformation. It can't avoid it. So it is rotating through that eclipsed conformation continuously. It's just spending more time in the um, staggered conformation. So it's quickly passing through eclipsed to get to staggered. All right, we can actually chart, we can actually plot this energy here. It's going to look something like this as this is rotating. So it's going to be rotating through eclipsed, eclipsed, um, staggered, eclipsed, staggered. So high energy, higher energy, staggered, lower. Higher energy, staggered, lower. It's going to keep going through here every time it rotates. Why is the eclipse conformation higher in energy? Electron-electron repulsion between the bonds and the eclipse conformation increases its energy. This is called torsional strain. Okay, so um, when we have these 
bonds eclipsed. These are getting, it doesn't look like it, if we look sideways, these are getting um, closer to each other. And they're sort of getting in each other's way. It's better for it to be like this so they're not right next to each other, adjacent to each other. So that's much better for them. All right, so difference in energy between the two conformations in ethane is 2.9 kcals per mole. So um, let's label this a little bit. This is um, theta equals 60. Theta equals zero degrees. And we have an energy difference here of 2.9. And again, staggered, a lower energy, eclipsed, higher energy. So we have a 2.9 kcal per mole energy barrier. We have 20 kcals per mole kinetic energy at room temperature. So we have plenty of energy to overcome this barrier. Um, so this is rotating very fast. faster than we can imagine. I mean, we can't even imagine it. It is 10 to 11 times per second. So the internal rotation here is, is not smooth, even rotating like this graph would suggest, right? Uh, it's not um, continuous spinning. If it was continuous even spinning, then it would then the molecule would spend as much time in the eclipsed as it is in the staggered, but it's not. Um, it's a um, succession of abrupt jumps. from one staggered conformation to another. So if you took a snapshot of this molecule frozen in time, you would see that of a sample of ethane, you would see that probably 98% of the molecules were in the staggered conformation. So, so basically you go, you, you know, you're in the staggered, you go whoom, and then whoom, and whoom. So long in the staggered, very quickly through um, the um, eclipsed conformation. All right, questions about conformations of ethane? Yeah. Uh, do the hydrogens always have to be drawn out, or can you imply them? Can you imply? Like, you know, sometimes we do yeah, good question. He asked if the hydrogens have to be drawn in or if they're implied. If you write nothing on the end, that still means carbon. Oh. So it's like skeletal. You have to write the you have to write them in. And then the other question is, um, when it has that certain amount of energy, when it spins, how does it gain the energy back? The the temperature of the room. Remember, it was getting energy from the heat of the room, heat of the environment. Okay. Let's talk about butane. Butane and higher molecular weight alkanes have more than one carbon-carbon bond that can rotate. Again, we are just focusing on carbon-carbon bonds here, but all of these carbon-hydrogen bonds are also rotating very quickly. So here's butane. Uh, let's number from the left. And I'm going to look from the left just because that's, that's how I do it. So we're going to go one, two, three, four. So this is. One carbons number one, two, and three, and four. We can we can look. Uh, we've got a couple different things that we can do. We can look at rotation about this C1, C2. We can also look at C2, C3. C3, C4 would be the same as C1, C2. We would just if we just flip the molecule. So there's really only two bonds we're going to look at: the C1 and the C2. That rotation, and then we'll, next we'll look at the C2 and C3. So if we look at C1 and C2, the carbon in the front has, um, is that an upside down Y or a right side up Y? 
It's an upside down Y. So the leg of the Y is what goes straight up and down when you're doing a Newman projection. In the back, what do we have? Right side up or upside down Y? Right side up. Right side up Y. So this bond here and that bond here are the ones that are straight up and down, parallel with the edge of your page. Carbon in the front has bonded to three hydrogens. Carbon in the back is bonded to a hydrogen and a hydrogen and what? What would we call this? An ethyl. All right. So um, now we know. So now, so when that takes, it's good to take a look at what we have before we start drawing the Newman projection, so we get it right here. So I am, again, I go from the left hand side. I'm viewing from this angle. So here's my eye, looking here. Sighting along that carbon one, carbon two. Some of you are going to have a lot of trouble picturing this. And so what you do is you take your models out, you make a model, and you do it. You do it a couple times, and then your brain says, oh, okay, I see it. And you're fine after that. Okay, so I'm viewing from the left-hand side. I see uh, an upside down Y. So I'm going to go like this. Draw my circle. Upside down Y. Extends past the borders of the circle, so it looks like that. Almost like a little peace sign here. All right, um, in the back, these bonds are, uh, this is a staggered conformation in the back. These bonds are bisecting this angle here. So uh, front is pretty easy. I have a hydrogen, a hydrogen, and a hydrogen. In the back, on the leg of the Y, I have um, an ethyl group. Now. It can get tricky drawing these things. We can write CH2, CH3. Um, or if you want to use an abbreviation, ET is an abbreviation for ethyl. And it's a lot easier to draw these when you use abbreviations. I do need to put my hydrogens here. If I don't, then that means that's a methyl group. OK, so we de definitely want to do that. So this right here, again, is C1. This big fat circle is C2. And this is the uh, staggered conformation. Dihedral angle theta is 60 degrees. This is the lowest energy. Now, if we rotate this, let's rotate it. So when we rotate Newman projections, we keep one side the same and rotate the other. There's no rule that you have to rotate. You, can, you, 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 can, you certainly could rotate both, but how are you going to keep track of what's going on when you're rotating both? Want to keep one, one side the same and the other side um, change. So uh, I'm going to keep the back the same. I'm going to use ET for ethyl. And now the eclipse conformation, they're both going to be right side up wise. So put the hydrogen, you know, put these where, close to the other bonds. And I tend to make them a little short, shorter so that I have room to put in what I need to put in here. So there's a hydrogen, there's a hydrogen, and there's a hydrogen right here. And just fit it as best as you can. This is the eclipse conformation. which is highest energy. By the way, when you're putting these groups on here, you, meet, you need to make sure that the, the, the bond that's, the, the, the atom that's bonded to it is actually drawn here. So uh, don't draw like this. Don't draw like this or you're going to get it marked wrong. So let's read, I'm going to redraw the first one here. I'm just going to do the carbon on the back. Well, no, we'll just do, we'll do both of them. A lot of people do, um, let's see.
like that. That would be marked wrong. Everybody see why? We're bonded to the carbon that only has two hydrogens, not to the carbon that only has, that has three. If you draw it that way, you've just drawn carbon with five bonds. So um, it's, it's typically a lot easier just to use ethyl. So you can use ethyl. And the other thing is, you, so, so you can use uh, for CH3, CH2, um, you can use ethyl. For CH3, some people um, like to use uh, me for methyl. Then you don't have to worry about that. Questions on that point here, so it's a really common mistake. We, we're, we're, we're not bonded to this carbon, we're bonded to this carbon. And, and, you know, and likewise, you, you know, if you write it like this, CH3, it's kind of a little confusing there. What are, we bond, are we bonded to the hydrogen or are we bonded to the carbon? You kind of want to try to draw it so that you're bonded to the atom that you need to be bonded to. All right, so for rotation about C1, C2, all of the um, staggered conformations are equal in energy. Um, let's look at C2, C3. Now, I'm, I'm viewing this way, right here. And before we draw this, let's take a look at what we have. Carbon 1, what is, is a, a right side up or upside down Y? Right side up Y, we have a hydrogen and a hydrogen and a methyl. So we can write CH3 or we can write ME. What about the back? Upside down Y and on the, on the leg of the Y we have another methyl. So let's draw that. It's right here. Already drawn for us, how about that? So we have, um, so this is C2, this is C3. Methyl is on the leg of the Y. The leg of the Y is straight up and down in the back. Methyl is also on the leg of the Y. It's straight up and down. It's going up. This one's going down because this is a right side up Y. In the back, we have an upside down Y. And this is actually the one we started with. This is the lowest energy conformation. The reason it's the lowest energy conformation is that the two largest groups are opposite each other. This is called anti. Anti staggered or staggered anti. The two largest groups are opposite each other. They're as far away from as each other as they can get. So the two largest groups are anti. So in an anti-staggered, the two largest groups are 180 degrees from each other. And what we're doing is we're keeping the front the same here and rotating the back. And we're doing it, we're rotating clockwise 60 degrees at a time. All right, so um, keeping the front the same. So we're going to do the front the same. We're going to go boom and rotate clockwise. So there's the methyl here. Then we're going to rotate 60 degrees. We're back to staggered. We're going to rotate 60, rotate 60 more degrees. We'll be right here. We're going to rotate 60 more. We're staggered again. And then 60 more. So that's that. And then 60 more. We're right back to that. So there's six conformations here. Which one would be the worst of all? What number? Four. Number four. The two largest groups are eclipsed. That's highest energy. Here we have um, the two largest groups, 60 degrees um, angle, dihedral angle from each other, right? That's called gauche. So we have three staggered, but only one is staggered anti. This is staggered gauche, these two large groups, 60 degrees. It's better for them to be 180. And then we have eclipsed. We have several eclipsed. Of all the eclipsed, um, this one is the worst, where we have the two large groups eclipsed. 
All right, so let's label some of these. This is gauche. Two largest groups, 60 degree, with 60 degree angles. 60 degrees from each other. This one here, highest energy. Two largest groups eclipsed. All right, so we have two that are equal in energy and two that are not, and, and two, two groups that are equal in energy. So hydrogen methyl eclipsed, hydrogen methyl eclipsed, hydrogen, hydrogen. So that's exactly the same as this. So number two is the same energy as number six. And um, staggered gauche, here we have two methyls, 60 degree dihedral angle, same here. So three and five have equal energy. All right, so we can plot this. And that's on the, shown on the next page. All right, so lowest energy of all is going to be anti-staggered. That's right here. Then we have the eclipsed, and then we're going to rotate back again. So this is gauche. Gauche a little bit higher in energy. How much higher? 0.9 kcals per mole. So we go through gauche, anti-staggered, eclipsed, gauche, staggered, worst eclipse, two largest groups eclipsed. That's the highest energy by 6 kcals per mole. That's pretty high. And then we go right back down here to the uh, gauche, 0.9 kcals per mole higher. And then we go back to 6. So remember, 2 and 6 were the same, 3 and 5 were the same. And then we go back down to anti here. So that's a graph that shows all that. Um, I will not be asking you to draw a graph like this on the exam. There's no way, OK? I would have you draw that. But I do want you to recognize which are higher energy, which are lower energy, OK? just by looking at the molecule. All right, so let's just, lab let's just label the lowest energy and the highest energy. And highest energy. And we can actually make calculations. We could actually get these numbers by doing calculations. Let me show you a sample one on the next page. So it comes confirmation four. So that's this one, this terrible one here. Has additional steric strain due to two eclipses. Oh, I forgot something on this page. So what, what happens here, we call this steric strain when these groups get too close to each other. So this is... Uh, the two methyls are too close. So we call this steric strain or steric hindrance. So when this molecule rotates, you see how close those hydrogens are to each other. They're not happy. They're definitely not happy like that. All right, so that's steric hindrance. We can actually calculate the values in this energy diagram can be used to estimate destabilization caused by other eclipsed groups. So here's the eclipsing energies here. Um, we'll do, uh, it's actually time now, so we'll stop there and we'll do this calculation when we come back next time.